Hi all, welcome to Mains Maxima. In this video, we will be discussing the model answers for ethics, integrity and aptitude paper. So the first question is on uh, judicial ethics and the need for ethics in judiciary. Why judiciary is important? Why ethics is required in judiciary? Because uh, judiciary is an important pillar of Indian democracy. Not only in Indian democracy, any democracy would not survive without an independent judiciary. So, in order to maintain the impartial nature of the judiciary, in order to maintain integrity of the judiciary, in order to maintain the confidence of public over judiciary, ethics is too important for judiciary. So, uh, let's go to the first question. I will read out the question. Discuss a judicial code of ethics based on the Supreme Court's charter on restatement of values of judicial life 1997. Any proper answer has three important components. The first component is introduction, the second component is body and the third component is conclusion. Writing an attractive introduction is too important to seek the attention of uh, the evaluator. So when you write an, a, a good introduction, the evaluator is interested in evaluating your paper and thus increases your marks. So let's start the introduction like this. The answer which we have given here is a model answer. So, uh, based on this, you can construct your own answer. First, uh, we, we may mention that a dishonest judicial personage is an oxymoron. A judicial person has to be honest. A dishonest person cannot be a judicial person. So, this by itself is an oxymoron. And as we discussed earlier, judiciary is an integrity institution. We can mention these two points in the introduction. Then, we have to mention about uh, how the charter was introduced. In 1997, the full bench of Supreme Court, they signed a charter. The charter was titled as Restatement of Values of Judicial Life. So, it has 16 points to be followed, 16 ethical principles to be followed by the judicial officers while officiating their duty. The known philosopher John Rawls says that judiciary is fairness. The fairness is imminent for judiciary. So, uh, the points of the charter which is in accordance with fairness are given below. Like judiciary has to be impartial. So, the actions of the judicial officers should be in the line that the behavior and conduct of the judicial officers should be in accordance with keeping up the impartialness of the uh, judiciary. Judiciary is an institution of impartiality. Impartial institution cannot be judicial. Judicial institution. So, the conduct and behavior of judicial officers should be in accordance with this principle. Any judge of the Supreme Court or a high court, whether in his personal capacity or in his official capacity, should not do anything which erodes the credibility of the perception. And the second aspect is about impropriety. A judicial officer should be a man of propriety. So, a judge should not contest any election to any office or club or any society. And this particular rule does not extend to uh, the judges holding any position in bar council or uh, any judiciary related uh, societies. And as we discussed earlier, the, the aspect of impartialness comes in again. And uh, the impartialness is related with the colleagues, family and uh, friends. And uh, the judges of the today were the lawyers of the yesterday, were the advocates of the yesterday. And they will have some good rapport with the present practicing lawyers. So, uh, the charter has mentioned that the judges should avoid having any close association with individual members of the bar, particularly those who practice in their own office. And the other aspect of impartiality is avoiding nepotism. Nepotism is nothing but favoring one's own family. A judge should not allow any of uh, his or her family, close family members to practice in the court in which he is officiating. Apart from this, a, ju a judicial officer will be awarded with a government residential place and any close family member who is already practicing in the bar should not stay with the judge in that official residence. A judicial officer should practice a dignity. He, he should practice aloofness and with that aloofness comes in the dignity of the office. If he is not aloof with the external relationship, then the dignity of his judicial office is being under question and this violates the principle of uh, justice. The third aspect of uh, avoiding nepotism is about not hearing the cases in which the close family member or friend or uh, well acquainted person is being uh, inquired for. The next aspect is about uh, ethical aloofness. A judge should not engage in any public debate or uh, express his opinion about a particular case which is being uh, under judicial question. Because speaking about a case which is enquiring would create a chance of prejudice. If at all a judge is speaking openly about uh, speaking openly or expressing his opinion about a particular case which is, uh, which is being handled by him or her will create a sense of prejudice, uh, will uh, lead to the judicial determination. 
predetermination of justice which is again violation of the uh, law of justice because justice is fairness as we all know apart from this a judge should not uh, receive any gifts from the persons other than his family and the most important aspect is about uh, the judgment should speak for themselves and not the judges and uh, this becomes too important in the recent uh, event that happened in supreme court so uh, the important aspect of the judicial charter is that the judgment should speak for themselves not the judges a judge should avoid hearing any cases in which he have vested interest in consider for example uh, a judge has uh, judge holds some share in a company and there is a case against the company and the case comes to the court where the judge is practicing this will create a sense of uh, insecurity for justice so in, in those cases the judges should recuse themselves from hearing those cases and a judge should not speculate in shares stocks or uh, any other uh, apart from this a judge should not involve directly or indirectly in a trade or business uh, either in his personal capacity or along uh, as a partner with any other person the most important aspect is about financial property a judge should not ask for any donations or contributions for any uh, any reasons so a judge should not ask for or accept any contributions or otherwise he should not ask for any donations from anyone for any purpose and any financial benefit should not be uh, sought after as a perquisite of him or her being occupying a particular judicial position judiciary is the final frontier of public confidence and whatever the actions of judiciary is the public is watching the gaze of public is watching the actions of judiciary so the judges must understand that he or she is under the public gaze for every action they are committing while they are undertaking their duty in their office so the judicial officers should act in such a way that the dignity of the judicial office is being upkept and the public esteem which is being enjoyed by the judiciary is being maintained so uh, we have discussed introduction and we have discussed the body now it's time for the conclusion so as in the case of introduction the conclusion should also be more interesting and attractive in order to fetch you more marks again uh, this is just a model conclusion based on these points everyone has their own perspectives based on these points or uh, they can add new points they can have their uh, you can have your own conclusion a judge must respect and honor the judicial office any action of the judicial office should uh, upkeep the respect of judicial office and you know, it should maintain the confidence that uh, confidence of public over the judicial office societal equilibrium and faith in rule of law depends on the strength of judicial officers dignity if at all the judiciary is not maintaining its dignity the societal equilibrium and the confidence over rule of law is put under burner and integrity is hallmark of judicial discipline therefore judicial officers should follow the charter in order to upkeep their integrity in order to maintain judiciary as a public institution of higher confidence the next question is related with media ethics so we are all facing the wrath of uh, fake news in the contemporary times and the this particular phenomenon is explained by another term called post truth so some researchers say that this is the uh, era of uh, post truth where uh, the post truth induced fake news is creating more uh, societal disturbances so let's go to the question the question is explain the term post truth discuss how post truth induced fake news can create ethical problems the question has two parts the first part is about defining post truth second part is about explaining the fake news that is being induced by post truth phenomenon and the third part is about the ethical problems that is being created by the fake news we will have to answer these three parts of the question in order to fetch a maximum mark so what does the term post truth mean post truth denotes some circumstances in which the objective facts loses the importance and emotional aspects gain more importance there was uh, once there was a binary system uh, which was a truth and lie now we live in a particular uh, period where there is a clear uh, line of separation between truth and lie is diffused and it has become a neither truth nor lie so the fine line of separation between the truth and lie is uh, diffusive and this has led to the phenomenon of post truth so apart from this the role of media is to give a proper information the proper news to the public and uh, 
because of this diffusive truth phenomenon and the post truth phenomenon the media has now resorted to uh, sugar coat the truth or uh, informing the news to the people providing improvised truth and this aspect does not augur well for the communication and the role of media in communication is to pass information without any partialness as far as uh, judiciary is an integrity institution media has to has to be an institution of impartiality so the uh, with the diffusion of this fine line between the fine line of separation between truth and lie now the media has resorted to a uh, sweet coat or sugar coat the truth or giving an uh, upgraded form of truth to the public so uh, this violates the basic tenets of media ethics and uh, professor amartya sen says that the post independent india has uh, witnessed very less or no famine compared to the pre independent india for this aspect he attributes the role of uh, free media he says that in the pre independent period the uh, press people they were not accountable to the public they were rather controlled by the government that is the uh, colonial government but uh, in the post independent period they stood accountable for public and they spoke truth and because of this accountability and because of the way they spoke truth the famine has not the famine, no famine has occurred in india after post independence in the, uh, as it happened in pre independent india so truth truth is the primary virtue of media truth is the ultimate virtue and truth has to be the linchpin around which the uh, the wheel of media should run on so the framework of core media ethics is based on these particular aspects the first is accuracy the second is impartiality third is humanity and uh, the last aspect is about transparency and accountability we have discussed uh, about the accountability earlier with the amartya sen's example and transparency transparent media is too important for maintaining good governance corruption free governance in india and humanity humanity is the basic of all virtues helping others or uh, speaking about the problems of the plight of common man has to be the role of media impartiality as we discussed earlier uh, media should practice impartiality and media is an institution of impartialness and accuracy accuracy is about uh, providing uh, factual empirical information to the public without any bias and accuracy and impartiality they goes well together these factors contribute to the fine tuning of editorial choices so what this uh, post truth induced fake news has uh, created what are the problems that are created by these uh, fake news first it has led to the circulation of malicious lies as we discussed earlier truth is the ultimate virtue because of this fake news we are spreading lies which is uh, antithetical to the basic tenets of humanity and uh, while writing these points it is more important that we add examples either from the lives of uh, great leaders or from the contemporary current affairs the example for the circulation of malicious lies would be about the mob lynchings happening in the country over a rumor spreading in whatsapp about uh, alleged child lifters and this post truth induced fake news has led to ineffectiveness in fact checking and apart from this globally this fake news has been used as a tool to rebuild the populist propaganda if we go to the world history if, if we see the annals of history this fake news were the main reasons with which hitler and uh, the other fascist leaders gained prominence in their country hitler used a separate division under his minister gobels in order to create a factory of rumors based on which his supremacy was constructed the next important impact of uh, fake news is about racism and sexism racism sexism has been uh, uh, violating the basic tenets of human uh, dignity and this fake news has given potential to abuse uh, people abuse humans uh, racially and uh, based on sex and the emergence of this post truth is as uh, posed a challenge to the fundamental cornerstone of ethical journalism ethical journalism is nothing but a journalism which has impartiality accuracy transparency these challenges of the fake news and alternative facts have highlighted the challenges to the ethical communication these challenges are not new as we have witnessed in the phenomenon of rise of fascist leaders in the annals of history and using this fake news uh, the perpetrators they uh, the unethical media houses they speak for a particular agenda which is hidden 
which is hidden under the line but the major impact will be based on the news the fake news which they are spreading pragmatic shift from newspaper television media to internet media so a uh, research by pew international research center says that more than 50 percentage of the people globally get their news from social media feeds be it facebook or twitter or instagram and as far as uh, more technical more uh, the country with uh, more higher internet connectivity that is usa is concerned more than 60 percentage of the people they get news from social media so social media has an important role to play in uh, containing the spectra of uh, fake news to communicate ethically is to be committed to the overarching principles of being true truth is the primary virtue of journalism the journalism should be open to difference and these uh, journalism should be supportive to freedom and it's time for conclusion the conclusion has to be attractive as we uh, discussed earlier now science has to be the last meta narrative science has to be the last resort to restrict the spread of fake news in the present postmodern world to address this is problems caused by this broader climate of fake news and post-truth phenomenon it's high time that we follow the tenets of ethical journalism the next question is about uh, transparency in governance so what is the need for transparency in governance transparency in governance reduces the opaqueness with which the government is functioning corruption is a disaster in governance like in any disaster uh, we have mitigation and management we have many tools for uh, managing the disaster called corruption in governance and we have uh, many institutions being set up by the government to impact manage the disaster called as corruption in governance so uh, we have uh, central bureau of investigation we have uh, enforcement directorate we have central vigilance commission we have uh, other uh, we have prevention of corruption act 1986 and recently government has moved in uh, amendment to the prevention of corruption act 1986 and these are all about managing the corruption and uh, this happens after the crime is being committed now as in any disaster mitigation is important management is just an after exercise we need a pre-exercise mitigation is now being provided by the preventive vigilance so this preventive vigilance gains more importance considering the fact that India is standing at the position of 81 in uh, transparency international's uh, corruption perception index so in the, with the country which has uh, immense growth potential which has uh, which is being touted as the world's fastest growing economy for the second continuous year these kind of uh, negative marks would pull down the growth of India. The elephant will never rise if corruption is not being curtailed. So, preventive vigilance is an important tool. Let's go to the question. Discuss the need for preventive vigilance in bringing transparency in governance. So, th this question has two parts. The first part is about preventive vigilance. We have to mention what preventive vigilance is and how preventive vigilance will help in bringing transparency in governance. So, we have to interlink between transparency in governance and the preventive vigilance. While giving introduction, we have to define what preventive vigilance is. Preventive vigilance is adoption of various measures to improve systems and procedures to eliminate or reduce corruption. So, preventive vigilance is a mitigative tool to prevent corruption. The important uh, process through which preventive vigilance can be established is through standardization, automation, leveraging technology, transparency, accountability, control and supervision, training and awareness. These are the tools of preventive vigilance which can be used along with this information technology to play a pivotal role in reducing interface and discretion. So when does corruption happen? Whenever there is any discretionary action happening because of any interface between two parties of uh, action. When does corruption happen? Corruption happens because of discretionary misuse of power or discretionary abuse of power. So when an officer uh, has an uh, interface with another person who is seeking some uh, benefit from the officer, then uh, the officer, because of this human interface, there will be some kind of interactions happening between these two people. And because of this, this interaction may be uh, material or non-material. Uh, because of this interaction, uh, the officer may use his uh, discretion to abuse his power. This will cause corruption. So, the as we discussed earlier, the main aim of this preventive vigilance is not to wait for commission of the offence, but to ensure its prevention by identifying the vulnerable areas in the steel frames of bureaucracy. Identifying vulnerable areas and identifying the potential areas is too crucial for implementing preventive vigilance. 
and the important areas in which more vul vulnerable areas of governance includes procurement, human resource management, delivery of services, sale of goods and services, enforcement of rules and regulations etc. In these areas which are vulnerable to corruption, the preventive vigilance has an important role to play and in these areas we can follow the following measures to restrict the commission of an offense. So uh, let's consider this example of uh, public distribution system. So considering this example of public distribution system, uh, the public distribution system was marked with leakages, either uh, exclusion leakages or inclusion leakages. So the government acting in a proactive manner, they introduced this ENA and they have introduced uh, uh, geotagging the vehicles which is carrying uh, the food grains for these uh, PDS shops. So this is a uh, positive step. So this kind of positive step which uh, embraces information technology and the ideals of proper transparent governance is important and it's imperative and this can be implemented by following these principles of preventive vigilance. See this uh, principles of preventive vigilance along with information technology can be used in this following measures. So the first aspect is about standardization and simplification of rules. Archaic rules will never do good for good governance. Archaic rules will create an opaque wall between the common man who is seeking for service and an officer, public officer. So the rules has to be simplified. And this simplified rules will increase clarity and accountability. And this will eliminate, most importantly, this will eliminate discretion and arbitrariness. Arbitrariness is misuse of power. By doing all this, the simplification of rules will reduce corruption. As we discussed earlier, the technology has to be leveraged. We can make use of e-procurements, uh, we can make use of e-payments, websites to reduce human interface. Human interface is the focal point in which uh, the corruption starts. For the recent, uh, for uh, during the, for the past five or six years, the banks are using e-auction for the properties which is uh, booked under Surface Act. So under Surface Act, uh, the loan defaulters property will be auctioned off and earlier with uh, human intervention with the human interface in place the corruption was too high now with the introduction of digital uh, mechanism or introduction of e-auctioning methods uh, this corruption has come down so the next aspect is about uh, uh, business process re-engineering what is business process business process is a practice or set of rules with which a particular business is being operated. Say in a government office, it makes a rule book with which the uh, officer is undertaking his day-to-day -day course. So uh, the business process has to be re-engineered with the objective of reducing corruption or with the objective of uh, preventing leakage of any revenue. The next aspect is about uh, introducing automation. Automation will reduce human interface. As we discussed earlier, reduced human interface will reduce the incidence of corruption. And uh, then uh, the next is about uh, transparency. Any country seeking to provide good governance to its citizen cannot be uh, cannot avoid transparency. Transparency is too important for good governance. So transparency removes information gap between the service provider and the service receiver. The service provider here is the government and the service receiver here is the common man. Uh, the next is uh, about accountability and awareness. Accountability. Accountability is too important for the service providers. Awareness is too important for the service receivers that is common man. A common man has to be aware that, aware of his own rights and the service receivers that is a common man should be aware of their rights and the pub service providers that is the public servants they should be accountable to their duty and they should be accountable to the public so in uh, improving the accountability and awareness with between the service providers and the service receivers will reduce the chances of corruption so the next is will be about uh, introducing stringent control and supervision and this is with the supply side of services that is uh, with the, in the side of uh, public servants Regular and routine inspections, surprise inspections, audit and reviews will keep a check on aberrant and corrupt behavior. Early detection of misconducts will reduce the loss being created by a uh, corrupt action. And this will reduce uh, and it will facilitate control over further damage. The next aspect is about time bound and effective punitive actions. So punishment, the people committing any corrupt action should be aware that whenever they violate the rule, whenever they violate any regulation, whenever they deviate from their role for any material or pecuniary needs, 
then they should be aware that they will be punished by the law and this should be effective yeah, this effective and time bound punitive action will create fear in the minds of violators this time bound and effective punitive action will make the public servants more responsible and they will be afraid to deviate from their duty and the next would be regarding to providing infrastructure facilities or providing certain facilities to the public servants like uh, public servants should be provided with uh, they should be paid well and their uh, personal needs to be taken care of like conveyance allowance housing allowance they should be given with that their need uh, the additional need will come down and because of this corruption will also come down this is an action in the perspective of human resource management the next is about creating awareness among public the public should be aware what their rights are and they should be always ready to claim for their rights the next uh, aspect will be on creating conducive work environment so there are some certain sensitive posts which can act as the fountain head of corruption in certain offices those kind of posts has to be identified and the person with high integrity and high value should be posted in that particular place so that in order to avoid corruption happening from that particular position and uh, protection to whistle blowers also comes under this particular aspect and the next would be about inculcating moral values moral values or internally acquired values which with the experience gained during our development will guide our actions in an ethical manner and we the moral values has to be inculcated the next is about a concept called integrity pact integrity pact is an uh, written agreement between a government department government office or a government company with an uh, service provider or any bidder for government contract in this integrity pact these two parties they agree to refrain themselves from bribery collusion or any other kind of uh, corrupt activities this integrity pact is implemented by cvc and the sanctions are applied uh, and whenever there is an instance of violation of this integrity pact sanctions are being applied and these integrity pacts are supervised by independent external monitors appointed by cvc these measures augmented with information technology will act as an effective preventive vigilance measures and preventive vigilance is most crucial in the aspect of india's developmental aspirations the uh, india's ease of doing business rank has improved substantially but india is lagging in the place wherever their transparency is required in governance so introducing transparency in governance inculcating uh, uh, ethical actions of uh, government officers is most imperative for developing india's stand in global order thank you